This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 21, coming up on Space Time. Rewriting the history of star formation at the heart of the Milky Way galaxy. A new headquarters officially opened for the Australian Space Agency. And the importance of the March equinox in defining astronomy's celestial coordinate system of right ascension and declination. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. New observations have rewritten the history of star formation at the centre of the Milky Way galaxy. The findings reported in the journal Nature Astronomy show that rather than a steady continuous stream of star formation over billions of years in the nuclear stellar disk, it actually occurred in two massive bursts. The first, more than 8 billion years ago, produced some 90% of all the stars in the region. That was followed by a long quiescent period, with hardly any new stars being formed at all. Then, about a billion years ago, a second massive burst of star formation took place, responsible for some 5% of the region's stars. This brief but intense period of starburst is likely to have been one of the most energetic events in the history of our galaxy. Hundreds of thousands of newly formed massive stars would have exploded as supernovae within millions of years. The nuclear stellar disk is a dense disk-shaped region with a diameter of about a thousand light-years, roughly 1% of the diameter of the Milky Way's majestic disk of stars. This disk surrounds the Milky Way's innermost nuclear cluster of stars and its central supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A-star. And the new timeline has consequences for the growth history of this black hole. That's because gas flowing into the central regions of the galaxy drives both star formation and increases the mass of Sagittarius A star. The newly reconstructed star formation history means Sagittarius A star is now likely to have already reached most of its present mass, just over 4 million times that of the Sun, more than 8 billion years ago. The findings have also rewritten the evolutionary history of the formation of the galaxy's central bar structure. You see, our Milky Way galaxy is actually what's known as a barred spiral galaxy, with an elongated region estimated to be somewhere between 3,000 and 15,000 light years long, linking the inner ends of its two major spiral arms. These bar structures are thought to be very efficient at funneling gas into the galaxy's central region, which would then lead to the formation of new stars. But billions of years without star formation in the nuclear galactic disk forces astronomers to rethink this scenario. During those quiet years, gas was evidently not funneled into the galactic centre in sufficient amounts. The study's lead author, Francisca Nogueras Lara, from the Astrophysics Institute in Andalusia, says either the galactic bar is a relatively recent feature, or these bars are not as efficient at funneling gas as what was thought. In the latter case, some other event, something like maybe a close encounter with a dwarf galaxy, must have triggered the flow of gas towards the galactic centre about a billion years ago. Astronomers reach their conclusions by using some fundamental insights of star formation. Stars only live for a certain span of time, and that depends on their mass and their chemical composition. When stars are born at the same time, which is common, astronomers can look at the ensemble of stars and plot the star's brightness against the reddishness of their colour in a colour magnitude diagram, and from that work out how long ago the entire ensemble most likely formed. One age indicator is the so-called red clump of stars that have already run out of core hydrogen for nuclear fusion and have now started fusing helium, turning them into red giants. So astronomers can work out the average age of stars in the group by determining the average brightness of the red clump stars. But there is a catch. You see, these techniques require astronomers to study separate individual stars. And that's not easy, because the galactic scent is obscured from Earth by massive clouds of gas and dust, forcing astronomers to look in the infrared to see through this veil. But because the galactic centre contains, well, quite literally, hundreds of thousands of densely packed stars in each cubic light year of space, it means these observations will take in too many stars, causing things to overlap. It's all very confusing. The authors solved this problem by using the European Southern Observatory's Hawkeye infrared camera to get accurate photometry of more than 3 million stars. Then, using a special technique called holographic imaging, they were able to better distinguish between the tightly packed stars and identify two separate stellar populations. 
The next step will involve filtering out the influences of dust on their observations. You see, the dust causes both further reddening, thereby amplifying the extent of the red clump stars, and also extinction, which blocks out some of the starlight. Once these are taken into account, the overall history of the galactic centre will become even more accurate. You're listening to Space Time. Still to come, Prime Minister Scott Morrison officially opens the fledgling Australian Space Agency's new headquarters. And later in Skywatch, the importance of the March equinox in defining astronomy's celestial coordinate system of right ascension and declination. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has officially opened the fledgling Australian Space Agency's new headquarters in Adelaide. The new agency is designed to coordinate and provide services to facilitate industries and operators wanting to establish space flight services in Australia. It's also established close links with other space agencies, including NASA and ESA. Morrison says ESA will provide Australia with a foothold into an industry expected to reach over a trillion dollars globally by 2040. And that's a far cry from visions of past Australian governments, which had claimed there was no future in space, as they sold off the nation's once extensive orbital space launch facilities at the Woomera Rocket Range in South Australia for scrap metal. In fact, during the 1950s and 60s, Woomera was the second biggest space launch complex in the world after Cape Canaveral, with hundreds of rocket launches, including Australia's first domestically built satellite, Resat, in 1967. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Professor Fred Watson. The Australian Space Agency has been officially opened. Indeed it has. The Space Agency itself has been operating now for two years, I think, thereabouts, maybe two and a half. But it's been based in Canberra in temporary accommodation. In fact, it's been in the building that I work in when I'm down in Canberra. Industry House, which is the home of the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. And that was always a temporary accommodation. And a year or so ago, there was an invitation for letters of interest about where the Space Agency should find its proper home. And a number of different states and cities vied for that honour. And in fact, the outcome was that it basically has gone to Adelaide, which is the capital city of South Australia, one of the states of our great nation. Yes, so located in the bowels of the continent. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. I've actually never been to Adelaide. So I, I Really? Have you never been to Adelaide? Never been to Adelaide. You missed a tree. It's a lovely city. I, I've seen it on TV. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a lovely city. Usually I've seen when, they're, when they're panning the cameras from the ta- light towers at the cricket. That's, that's, all, okay. I, that's right. all I've yeah. ever seen of Adelaide. No, there's a lot, go- a lot goes on in Adelaide. It's um, very, uh, yeah, it's well worth a visit. The mm. city of churches, it was always called. Yes. Uh, but, you know, Adelaide got that honour of hosting the... Australian Space Agency, partly because of a long history of South Australia being associated with space. I mean, I remember when I was a kid growing up back in the 1850s, well, maybe the, maybe the 1950s, if you talked about space, even in the UK where I grew up, Woomera was the name that came to mind. Woomera was part of South Australia where tests were carried out to launch rockets. And a lot of British rockets, when the Brits used to build rockets, they were actually tested there at mm. Woomera in South Australia. And, so and that, for those who want to know, Woomera is an Aboriginal word uh, meaning um, basically a spear thrower. They, they used to have a device they could rest the spear on and, and it gave them much more leverage and range and power to throw a spear uh, yeah. using the Woomera. And therefore, that's why we called the rocket range Woomera Rocket Range. Yeah, and it, so there's still, I think there are still artifacts from that era there. But the association with space, I think, still continues. There are organizations within Adelaide already which have a, a space focus, and several space industries are based there. So it was a natural, I guess it was a natural choice that the space agency should go to Adelaide. What has now happened is that their new building has formally been opened. It's at a place with the Slightly uninspiring address of Lot 14. Uh, Lot 14, I, th- I think it was a hospital I- uh, at one stage, which has now been refurbished mm. for a number of different organisations to have their headquarters there. Lot 14 could become as famous as Area 51, Fred. 
Oh, it could, yeah. Maybe for different reasons well. Maybe <laughs> the same reason, who knows? <laughs> you, don't know. you don't know. So uh, the Prime Minister went to Adelaide with the Minister for Science, Karen Andrews, cut the ribbon to open up the new Australian Space Agency's building. The remit of our Space Agency has always been the same pretty well ever since it was founded, which is to support Australian ventures in space. And by that, it principally means industrial and technical know-how that small companies that can provide services or actually um, make bits and pieces for rockets. That is what it's all about. It's about nurturing these companies. It's about providing an umbrella organisation so you don't get little startups all over the country doing the same thing. Mm. So it's very much got an industry focus. So most of its budget in fact, goes in things like supplying grants and essentially making inroads into providing companies with the backup that they need. There's a new initiative actually just been launched, which is all about inviting startup companies and uh, organisations like that, companies with good ideas, to apply for funding to the Australian Space Agency. So that's its focus. Its focus is in nurturing Australian industry. The world's space budget at the moment, and this is the commercial space budget, is round about $400 billion. We in Australia have about 1% of that. I think it's about 3.9 billion. That's the current space industry here in Australia. The government wants to see that grow to within to something like 12 billion within the next decade. So that's a tripling of what we do and a tripling of the jobs as well. There's about 10,000 people employed in the space industry here in Australia. They want that to go up to 30,000 by 2030. That's amazing. I knew I knew there was a big number in terms of future jobs, but that's incredible. Yeah. The space agency itself, I have to say, is pretty lean. It has a staff of 20. Uh, I wasn't you know, far off then, was I? No, you weren't. It's not like NASA. It's... And they, they still only have two desks. <laughs> they, sh- they share the desks. So uh, it's very much an organisation that f- facilitates things. That's certainly the way it has been seen and the way it's been set up. I know many of the people in the Australian Space Agency, and they are absolutely dedicated to this. They're very switched on. There are not many things that you can talk about in the space world where they say, oh, I haven't heard of that. <laughs> they've heard of most of it. Mm. So they've got, you know, they've got their finger on, on the pulse there across much of the industry. Eventually, there will be space launches from uh, Australia as well, probably awesome. down in the south, in South Australia, but also Australian Equatorial Launch is a company that wants to launch up in the north. And of course, that's not too far from the equator, which gives you an advantage when you're launching spacecraft into the standard orbits. With the the great news that the Australian Space Agency has been officially opened, we also hear some news about uh, Virgin Galactic because they've moved house. They, too, have um, taken up residence at their official New Mexico spaceport. That's right. So what they've done is moved the hardware, basically the principal hardware, which is the mothership and the uh, the space plane, VSS Unity, which is what will be used to fly fair-paying passengers to the edge of space. And that brings us a step nearer to that commercial service. So it's been in the Mojave Desert where these vehicles have been built and tested so far. All the space plane tests which we've talked about have been over the Mojave Desert. But now moving it to New Mexico to basically the Virgin Galactic Space Terminal at Spaceport America, which is not very far from a place called Truth or Consequences. Great name for a village. Oh, yeah, it is. That move really signals the start of the final proof tests for the the space plane and its mothership. In fact, the journey itself, it's a three-hour trip, I think, at high altitude from Mojave to the Spaceport America in New Mexico. And so that journey itself was part of the evaluation process because it's a three-hour trip, which is much longer than the space plane and the aircraft are normally operational. So it gives you a a new mode for environmental evaluation. So what they're going to do when they get to Spaceport America is do a lot Lots of final checks, probably we'll see more test flights, but we'll also see perhaps what you might call the refinement of the visitor's experience, how it will all come together with people going through the spaceport, how you feed visitors through that process, how you train them for their experience of space and how you give them the very best experience when they're actually on the trip. So we'll see lots of future activity. The press release that came says 
The relocation of VSS Unity to Spaceport America enables the company to engage in the final stages of its flight test program. It will begin with a number of initial captive carry and glide flights from the new operating base in New Mexico, allowing the spaceflight operations team to familiarize themselves with the airspace and ground control. Today, we realized that the next step in that dream by bringing our beautiful spaceship to New Mexico. We still have significant work ahead, but we're grateful to all our teammates who've made this day a reality. That's George Whitesides, who's the CEO of Virgin Galactic. So okay. uh, it will be interesting to see what happens next. And I think this sort of marks a new phase for Virgin Galactic. Hopefully we'll see fair paying flights before too long. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Still to come, this month marks the March equinox, important in astronomy because it's used to define the celestial coordinate system of right ascension and declination. <music> Moscow has launched a new military satellite into orbit for the Russian Ministry of Defense. The Meridium M number 19L communications satellite was launched from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome north of Moscow aboard a Soyuz 21A rocket equipped with a frigate upper stage. The mission had been delayed by about a month due to electrical problems with the launch's third stage. And those problems persisted during the ascent to orbit, with the third stage shutting down early due to a software glitch. Luckily, the frigate upper stage was able to compensate for the lack of velocity, successfully placing the spacecraft into a useful orbit. This was the second of the new integrated satellite system being launched by Moscow in the last seven months. This is Space Time. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for March on Skywatch. And I guess we should start off by wishing everyone a Happy New Year. Well, it would be if this was ancient Mesopotamia or Rome. That's because March was the first month of the New Year, going back to the earliest concept of celebrating New Year's Day at the time of the Vernal Equinox, around 2000 BCE. The early Roman calendar, which had just 10 months, designated March the 1st as the New Year. And of course that 10-month year is still reflected today, with names like September or Septum, Latin for 7, October or Octo meaning 8, November or Novem 9, and December or Deci meaning 10. You see, it wasn't really until the Gregorian calendar that January the 1st marked the start of the new year. But in the beginning, it was mostly only the Catholic countries that adopted it. Protestant nations only gradually moved across, with the British, for example, not adopting the reform calendar until 1752. Prior to that date, the British Empire and its American colonies still celebrated the new year on the 25th of March. Highlight of the month is the March Equinox, which this year takes place at 14.49 on the afternoon of Friday, March the 20th, Australian Eastern Daylight Time. That's 23.49 on the evening of Thursday, March the 19th, US Eastern Daylight Time, and 3.49 in the early hours of the morning of Friday, March the 20th, Greenwich Mean Time. For our listeners in the Northern Hemisphere, it's the Vernal Equinox, meaning the start of spring. Although south of the equator, it's the autumnal equinox, meaning a move into autumn. The day marks the point in Earth's orbit around the Sun when the planet's rotational axial tilt means the Sun will appear to rise almost exactly due east and set almost exactly due west to someone standing on the equator. It means almost equal hours of darkness and light. In fact, the very word equinox is derived from the Latin, meaning quies or equal and nox meaning night. It all comes about because Earth's rotational axis is tilted at an angle of around 23.4 degrees in relation to the ecliptic, the plane created by Earth's orbit around the Sun. And that axial tilt is pointed to the same position in the sky regardless of Earth's orbital position around the Sun. So on any other day of the year, either the northern or southern hemisphere will be tilted more towards the Sun. But on the two equinoxes, around March the 21st and September 23rd each year, the tilt of Earth's axis is directly perpendicular to the Sun's rays. The moment of the March equinox is also used to define the celestial coordinate system of right ascension and declination. In astronomy, the celestial coordinate system is the astronomical version of the latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates used on Earth's surface. It's used to specify the positions of objects in three-dimensional space and the direction of objects on the celestial sphere, the imaginary globe surrounding the Earth. It lets scientists determine the position of celestial objects such as satellites, planets, stars, galaxies and so on. 
Right ascension, which uses the symbol alpha, is the angular distance measured eastwards along the celestial equator from the vernal equinox. So, on the celestial sphere, it's analogous to terrestrial longitude. Declination, which uses the symbol delta, measures the angle north or south of the celestial equator. It's the celestial equivalent of terrestrial latitude. Marking the vernal equinox and setting in the western evening sky this time of the year is one of the oldest recognised constellations in the heavens, Taurus the Bull, which was first so named around 6,000 years ago. In Greek mythology, Taurus represents Zeus, the king of the gods, who lusted after King Agenor's daughter Europa, who was minding a herd of cattle. Of course, being a god, and with the powers of a god, Zeus transformed himself into a powerful white bull, so that he could get closer to the beautiful Europa. Once transformed into the bull Taurus, Zeus convinced Europa to climb on his back, and he then quickly carried her off to the island of Crete. Taurus's head is represented by a dominant V-shaped grouping of stars. The bright reddish star is Aldebaran, an orange giant about one and a half times the mass of the sun, located some 65 light years away. A light year is around 10 trillion kilometres, the distance a photon can travel in a year at 300,000 kilometres per second, the speed of light in a vacuum, and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. Aldebaran is the 14th brightest star in the night sky, and it's the closest bright star to the point of the vernal equinox. In ancient Arabic, Aldebaran's name means the follower, as it appears to follow the seven sisters of the Pleiades. It's also the first of four royal or guardian stars identified by the ancient Mesopotamians. Lying near Aldebaran is a V-shaped group of young newborn stars known as the Hades. These are the nearest open star cluster to Earth, located just 153 light years away. Turning to the north now, and you'll see two really bright stars. They're Polax and Castor, the two stars representing the northern constellation of Gemini the Twins. In Greek mythology, they were brothers who travelled with Jason aboard the Argo in search of the Golden Fleece. Polax is an orange-hued evolved giant star located some 34 light-years away. It has about twice the sun's mass and around 11 times its diameter. In 2006, an extrasolar planet, an exoplanet, designated Polax b, was discovered orbiting it. The planet's a gas giant, orbiting its host star every 1.61 Earth-years. The other primary star of Gemini, Castor, is located a bit further away, 51 light-years. It's actually a system of six stars comprising three eclipsing binaries. Eclipsing binaries are binary star systems in which the orbital plane of the two stars lies so nearly in line of sight to the observer that the stars appear to be eclipsing each other. Two of these binary systems are orbiting each other every 460 Earth years. The third binary appears to be somewhat reddish in colour. Located to the northeast is Regulus, or the Little King, the brightest star in the constellation Leo the Lion. The constellation Leo is mentioned by Homer in his famous 8th century poem, The Odyssey. According to mythology, Leo was killed by Hercules as the first of his twelve labours. Located some 79 light years away, Regulus is a multiple star system composed of at least four stars. Regulus A, designated Alpha Leonis, is a spectroscopic binary comprising a rapidly spinning spectral type B blue-white star, about 3.5 times more massive than the Sun, with some 288 times the Sun's luminosity. And it has a small companion, probably a white dwarf, the stellar corpse of a Sun-like star. The pair orbit each other every 40 Earth days. Spectroscopic binaries are double star systems, orbit each other so closely and at such an angle that they can only be visually separated from our point of view on Earth by their different spectroscopic signatures. Also, you've heard us use the term spectral types when referring to different stars. That's because astronomers describe stars in terms of their spectral type, a classification system based on temperature and characteristics. The hottest, most massive and most luminous stars are known as spectral type O blue stars, that's followed by spectral type B blue-white stars, then spectral type A white stars, spectral type F whitish yellow stars, spectral type G yellow stars, that's where our sun is by the way. Then there's spectral type K orange stars, and the coolest and least massive stars are known as spectral type M red stars. Each spectral classification can then also be further subdivided by using a numeric digit to represent temperature, with 0 being the hottest and 9 being the coolest. And at the end, there's a Roman numeral you can add. That represents luminosity. So, putting it all together, it means our Sun is classified as a G25 yellow dwarf star.
Also included in the stellar classification system are spectral types L, T and Y, which are assigned to failed stars known as brown dwarfs, some of which were actually born as spectral type M red stars, but became brown dwarfs after losing some of their mass. Brown dwarfs fit into a category between the largest planets, which are about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smallest spectral type M red dwarf stars, which are about 75 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter, or 0.08 solar masses. An interesting characteristic of the primary star in Alpha Leonis is that it achieves a full rotation in under 16 hours. By comparison, our Sun takes around 30 days to complete a full rotation. This gives Alpha Leonis an oblate appearance and causes a characteristic known as gravity darkening, meaning its poles are considerably hotter and some five times brighter per unit surface area than its equatorial region. That's because the equatorial surface is so much further than the polar surface from the star's core. Interestingly, if Alpha Leonis were rotating only around, say, 15% faster, the star's gravity would be insufficient to hold it together. It would literally spin itself apart. Located further away are the three other stars, Regulus B, C and D, which are all dim main-sequence stars. Main-sequence stars are those undergoing hydrogen fusion into helium in their cores. Regulus B and C are thought to be orbiting each other every 600 Earth years and are located around 5,000 astronomical units from Regulus A. Regulus B is a spectral type F white yellow star, while its companion Regulus C is a small spectral type M red dwarf star. The other star in the grouping Regulus D is a dim star which appears to share motion across the sky with the others in the group. At the opposite end of the constellation Leo from Regulus is the star Beta Leonis, or Dinobola, the horse's tail. It's also a luminous blue-white star, thought to be a spectral type A, about half as bright as Regulus, and the third brightest star in the constellation Leo. Beta Leonis has about 1.8 times the mass of our Sun, and about 15 times the Sun's luminosity. It's suspected of being a dwarf Cepheid, or Delta Scuti type variable star, meaning its luminosity varies very slightly over a period of several hours due to pulsations on its surface. Also in Leo, you'll find the Leo triplet, a group of three galaxies, Messier 65, Messier 66, and NGC 3628, all appearing relatively close together. Messier 65, also known as NGC 3623, is an intermediate spiral, or possibly even a barred spiral galaxy, about 37 million light years away. M65's disk appears to be slightly warped, and a relatively recent burst of star formation is highly suggestive of some gravitational interaction with the other two galaxies in the Leo triplet, maybe around 800 million years ago. Nearby is Messier 66, or NGC 3627. It's another intermediate spiral galaxy, some 95,000 light years wide, and about 36 million light years away. Gravitational interactions from its past encounters with the neighbouring galaxies in the triplet has resulted in it having an extremely high central mass concentration, that is, a high molecular to atomic mass ratio, and also a resolved non-rotating clump of neutral atomic hydrogen, apparently removed from one of its spiral arms. The third member in the group is NGC 3628, the Hamburger Galaxy, a spiral galaxy with a spectacular 300,000 light year long tidal tail of gas and stars. NGC 3628 is located some 35 million light years away. Its most conspicuous feature is the broad and obscuring band of dust located along the outer edge of its spiral arms, effectively transecting the galaxy to the view from Earth. Other bright well-known galaxies in LEO include Messier 95, Messier 96, Messier 105 and NGC 2903. Messier 95 and 96 are both spiral galaxies. Each is about 20 million light years from Earth. Meanwhile, NGC 2903 is a barred spiral galaxy. It's thought to be really similar in size and structure to our own Milky Way. It was discovered by William Herschel in 1784. Close to the M95-M96 pair is the elliptical galaxy M105, which is also around 20 million light years from Earth. The constellation also contains what's known as the Leo Ring, a cloud of hydrogen and helium gas orbiting two of the galaxies in the constellation. Turning to the east now, you'll see the constellation Corvus the Crow. Now, according to mythology, Corvus was such a clever bird he could talk to people. However, after refusing to speak to the god Apollo, he was banished into the heavens, together with Crater the Cup and Hydra the Snake. 
One of the brightest stars in Hydra is Alphard, the solitary one, so named because it appears to be all alone in the sky. Turning to the western horizon now, and there you'll notice the star Akamar at the southern tip of the constellation Eridanus the river. Akamar means the river's end, as it marks the end of the river Eridanus, Eridanus being one of the largest and longest constellations in the sky. Located around 139 light years away, Akamar is a binary star system, comprising two stars, Alpha Aridne A and Alpha Aridne B. Alpha Aridne A is a young, hot, spectrotype B blue star, some 6.7 times the mass of the Sun, with a stunning 3,150 times the Sun's luminosity. Akamar's extremely high rotational velocity of over 16 km per second gives it an oblate shape, making it one of the least spherical stars in the Milky Way, with an equatorial diameter some 56% greater than its polar diameter. This distorted shape means the star displays significant latitudinal temperature, with its polar temperature being more than 20,000 Kelvin, while its equatorial temperature is only around half that, 10,000 Kelvin, as it's much further away from the stellar core. The high polar temperatures are generating a fast polar wind, ejecting matter from the star and creating a polar envelope of hot gas and plasma. The companion star, Alpha Ridney B, appears to be a spectral type A white star with about twice the mass of the Sun. The two stars orbit each other at an average distance of roughly 12.3 astronomical units. An astronomical unit being the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, approximately 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. And just a quick reminder that March 14, that's 3.14 in America speak, marks the yearly celebration of the mathematical constant pi. We all know pi as the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. But it's also an irrational number, meaning its decimal representation never ends and it never repeats. More than just a number, pi has important applications in astrophysics, in orbital mechanics and in other fields of astronomy. Being so important, it's been calculated to well over a trillion digits. And the current record for reciting pi from memory is over 70,000 digits. As for me, 3.14159 is about it. As well as Pi Day, March 14 also marks the birthday of one of my heroes, the great professor, Dr. Albert Einstein. And speaking of greats, Jonathan Alley, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, joins us now for the rest of our tour through the March night skies. Good day, Stuart. Well, you know, normally we start with our tour of the sky down in the south, but this time, just to be different, I thought we'd start with the view up to the north. That's as seen from mid-latitudes down here in the southern hemisphere, where I am. So low down in the north at the moment, uh, you can see four constellations of the zodiac. You've got Taurus, Gemini, Cancer and Leo. Really easy to see if you've got a nice clear horizon. Cancer and Leo are a bit bare for the naked eye stargazer. There's not a lot in them. But Gemini and Taurus are really, really great. You can easily tell Gemini because of its two bright stars. They're called Castor and Pollux. And to its left, as seen from the south, or to its right, if you're looking from the north, is the constellation Taurus, but its bright red star Aldebaran. And in both of these constellations, uh, Gemini and Taurus, have lots of really great star clusters and things too. So if you can get a pair of binoculars and some nice dark skies, just have a sweep through this area because it's just beautiful star fields. really is quite lovely. Higher above them in the northern sky is the mighty Orion, the constellation we always talk about, at least over the summer months. For the, uh, it's the such a great constellation to use as your starting point because everyone oh. knows it, everyone yep. can see it, and it actually looks like a hunter. It's one of those rare combinations that you have there. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those constellations. It actually looks like what it's to be. Anyhow, look at Ryan. Yeah, it's up there. Grab the opportunity to see it now, though, because in a couple of months' time, it'll have gone. It'll have dropped below the western horizon after sunset, so we won't see it again until uh, late, uh, later in the year, late in 2020. For us, here in the south, at least, high overhead this time of year are the two brightest stars in the night sky. We've got Sirius and Canopus. Sirius is a double star system, and the larger of its two stars is twice as massive as our sun. Sirius' apparent brightness and apparent brightness means just how, how bright it looks to us here on Earth. Intrinsic brightness is how bright things really are uh, when measured from a standard distance, but apparent brightness is just how bright it seems in the night sky. So Sirius apparent brightness is around twice that of Canopus, but in fact Canopus is about four times as massive as Sirius, and intrinsically it's much, much brighter. It just seems dimmer because it's a lot further away. Canopus is about 310 light years from Earth, whereas Sirius is you know, vir virtually next door. It's right nearby at about eight and a half light years. 
So sweeping south along the Milky Way, the Milky Way is right overhead to the planet, sweeping south along the Milky Way, past Sirius, then past Canopus, we come down to the far southern constellations like the Southern Cross and Carina, both beautiful constellations. They're really beautiful to see. If you look around that sort of Milky Way area down the south there with a pair of binoculars, there are star clusters and star fields and dark nebulae and bright nebulae. They're just, they're just really spectacular. A pair of binoculars is all you need. You don't need to have a super-duper telescope or anything, so give that a try. Now, you'll see that the cross, the Southern Cross, is lying on its left-hand side at the moment, mid-evening during March. But as the Earth turns, it uh, will climb higher in the sky and become more upright. So if you go out around about 2.33 in the morning, something like that, if you're late getting home or you're up early or you just can't sleep or you're out stargazing, have a look and you'll see the Southern Cross is standing straight upright, much higher in the sky, and you really can't miss it. It's actually the smallest constellation by area in the entire sky, but it's because its stars are so bright and, and it is sort of small, that the stars are close together, it really is prominent. I mean, you cannot miss it. It's really tremendous. Great sight to see. Shifting to the planets, what you'll be able to see this month is Venus in the west after sunset. The planet's going to sort of hug the western horizon all month long, about 10 or 15 degrees above the uh, above the horizon after the sun has set. So you don't have a lot of time to see it after sunset, but it, you know, as long as you've got clear skies and a good, fairly clear horizon, no hills and trees and buildings and things in the way, you should be able to see Venus big and bright and, and you really can't miss it. The other naked eye planets, well, they're pre-dawn affairs. You've got to be up early because Mars is coming up over the eastern horizon about 2 o'clock in the morning. They've got to be up after midnight. And about half an hour after Mars comes up, Jupiter will come up over the horizon. And then about another half an hour after that, Saturn will come up over the horizon. So you've got three of them in a row, sort of forming a real tight, straight line, roughly the same sort of distance apart. Now, as the days go past this month, you'll see that Jupiter and Mars will come closer and closer together. Just slowly, 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 as each night goes by, they'll come closer and closer together. It's Mars that's actually doing the moving. Jupiter's pretty much static in place in the sky. But culminating on March 21, they'll be right next to each other, really, really close. It's going to be really spectacular to see big, bright, white Jupiter and, and about half the brightness Mars with its sort of ruddy orangey sort of colour right next to each other it'll be fantastic to see in fact keep an eye on all three of those planets from around about March 16 through to about March 21 or so because they'll all be close together and if you go out on the 19th you've got some clear skies you're up early uh, have a look in the east and you'll see three of them there and the moon right in the middle of them as well so that should be pretty spectacular to see uh, well, that's about it for March, Stuart, other than a reminder that uh, the equinox is going to occur, of course. So it'll be... 2.49pm. Yeah, on March the 20th here yep. in Australia. Yep. Mm. On, it'll be the 19th in other parts of the world. But the equinox, of course, is when the sun is above the equator. And it's the day when we get virtually equal hours of darkness and daylight. And for the southern hemisphere, it indicates that winter's on its way. And for our friends up in the north, it means that uh, summer's coming. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, Podbeam, Android, CastBox, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com or from your favourite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Spacetime online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies, or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to commercial-free double-episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 